This video is made possible by sponsors like today's Babbel. Learning a second language can broaden your cultural horizons, enhance your career opportunities, and improve your cognitive abilities. But oftentimes, the difficult part isn't actually learning it. This is where Babbel comes in. Babbel is a language learning app that makes the entire journey of learning a new language much easier. They focus on teaching the most important practical language that you'd actually use in conversation through short 10-minute lessons. I've actually been using the app myself for over six months now, and it's helped me on vacations, while communicating with coworkers, and even just as a conversation starter. Currently, I'm working on the Spanish Travel Essentials lesson in preparation for an upcoming trip, and it's actually been really helpful. In addition, Babbel offers multiple ways to learn, with podcasts, lessons, live classes, and even games to make learning suitable for everyone. With spring finally upon us, now is the perfect time to step out of hibernation and learn a new language with Babbel. Check them out and get up to 60% off by clicking the link down in the description below or by scanning the QR code on screen. Thanks again to Babbel for sponsoring this video and making this content possible. A few months ago, as I was mindlessly scrolling through TikTok, I stumbled across a strange video depicting women sitting in a parking garage perfectly lined up in what I can only describe as an influencer cubicle. A small area on the ground with a tripod, camera, lighting fixture, microphone, and a number card to mark the makeshift set. What piqued my interest even more about it though was that they appeared to be having the time of their lives, enthusiastically talking into the cameras. It seemed so dystopian that I was almost convinced it was fake. However, a few scrolls later and I stumbled upon another similar video, and then another, and realized that I had to dig a little deeper to figure out what was really going on here. As I searched for solutions, what became clear to me was far more disturbing than I anticipated. An entire underground world of influencer farms in China, made possible by exploiting not only the millions of viewers, but also the quote-unquote influencers themselves. From live streams fueled by virtual items with a heavy price tag, to the e-commerce live stream industry pushing hundreds of billions of dollars worth of product, this entire streaming industry goes much deeper than one could imagine. To understand how the live streaming factories became a thing, we first need to understand how different China streaming is to the West. China is a country with a deepening class divide and a simultaneous nationwide thirst for material success. As a young industry in China, live streaming sprouted in the mid 2000s, primarily focusing on performances live streamed for those unable to go to the event. But the market quickly changed, favoring streams where viewers could interact with a host as it went. And so, by 2015, hundreds of streaming platforms appeared, mostly featuring live streamers who made IRL and gaming content. This was very similar to how the West first developed with gaming live streams and then later branched into the commentary and IRL content. However, from this point onward, the divide between Western streaming and China streaming became more apparent. You see, in the West, tipping and donations only make up a small percentage of a streamer's earnings, with streamers instead relying on brand deals, ads, and paid subscriptions to ensure a stable income. But in China, live streamers on every platform have the ability to make money through virtual items purchasable by the viewer and redeemable for cash by the streamers. The same system TikTok uses that has been making the rounds in Western news for the way in which it enables and encourages explicit behavior from users. However, China is a different society in which explicit content is not acceptable. So instead, streamers found that the best way to get audiences to like them and donate while remaining safe for work was to make them relate to them. Chinese livestream viewers are 75% men and 70% under the age of 30, who after a long day at work, come home to watch live streams and forget about their real life struggles. To appeal to them, streamers dress simply, talk like common folk, and call themselves losers or diaosi in Chinese to relate to viewers and prompt donations. To make matters worse, it's the poorest Chinese livestream viewers who donated the most of their spare income to streamers, and still, these gifts from the poor viewers only make up a fraction of the market. 
You see, the real money they made was from the so-called two hows, the whales of China's livestream industry. The ones who have plenty of disposable income, they can spend on expensive virtual items. However, there are two kinds of two hows. The first are the honest people with a fortune and a large income who have developed some kind of parasocial relationship with the streamers and donate with the sole intention of exciting their friend and getting attention. But the second kind are the two hows who expect something in return. The ones who demand streamers to meet them in real life or use their donations as bait to lure streamers into agencies. Essentially, it was a competition to flaunt wealth, fight for attention, and induce envy into the DLC. And when I say it became a competition, I really mean a competition. As featured in the documentary, The People's Republic of Desire, streaming websites hosted an annual tipping competition with the streamer who received the most tips being awarded as the most popular host or hostess. And although this might seem harmless enough, it really just made money become the ultimate judge of who the next star is going to be. In a way, this was also the birth of the first Chinese influencer agencies, as some of the biggest two house realized that they could determine who the next big star would be with their money. Their agencies enticed streamers who had potential to join them by making large donations and promising them with fame. And it worked, with large streamers reportedly making 9 to 10 million US dollars a year from streaming, and smaller streamers feeling like the only way to get up to that point was to join an agency. However, when they joined the agencies, they would be greeted with harsh conditions and strict schedules. The biggest agencies required streamers to stream for at least six hours a day, post a minimum tip quota, and required they undergo constant surveillance, transforming the industry into a business model where squeezing every last dollar they could from viewers was the top priority. However, that world of streaming would not last for long. Live streaming in combination with large-scale tipping and competitions for money enabled behaviors that the Chinese government did not approve of. And so, in 2017, the government started cracking down on that world. First, they banned over 400 live apps for hosting content that promotes violence, pornography, gambling, superstition, and other values harmful to public morality. They then introduced an Orwellian code of conduct for online streamers that, among other things, required streamers to demonstrate socialist core values. The final blow came when the government attempted to set restrictions on the amount of money people are allowed to tip to streamers. Up until this point, streamers mostly made money through tips, and limiting the amount people can tip ruined their main source of income. And if the hit was hard for the streamers themselves, it was even harder for the agencies, who lost all of their leverage of being capable of making people stars through simply donating loads of money. They needed to find something to make them money through live streaming. And during the pandemic, they found exactly what they needed. In 2016, Alibaba introduced a live streaming feature in their Taobao marketplace that was moderately successful for sellers to promote their items on. And with the boom of e-commerce during the pandemic, real streamers saw the opportunity to partner with Chinese sellers and sell items to their followers for an affiliate cut. Not only was this a massive success, but it netted most streamers more than tipping ever did. The phrase live shopping has been around for decades in the West. For some, the term evokes memories of enthusiastic hosts on late night TV channels attempting to sell two-headed wonder mops, electric exercise equipment, and super sharp knives. When applied to live streaming in a Chinese audience, it was a massive success, with hundreds of thousands of streamers joining as hosts in 2019 alone. And so, we arrive at the present, a golden age for both sellers and creators alike. In 2020 alone, there was at least 1.23 million live stream hosts working in the industry, with Alibaba hosting over 68.5% of all live stream viewers in China, an industry now worth over 500 billion US dollars annually, with individuals like Huang Wei able to sell $8 billion worth of goods in a single year. For scale, this one individual is equivalent to almost a third of the total global sales of Macy's. However, influencer agencies were no longer able to leverage their funds by boosting celebrities with donations. And so, 
they found a way to exploit the poor, young, and impressionable once again. For a salary of only $120 a month, agencies will now recruit and train heaps of young women who want to get into the industry but lack the equipment and experience. And this new model is exactly how the dystopian footage came to be. These agencies are trying to save every penny, setting up training facilities in abandoned garages and barely providing cheap portable filming sets in an attempt to hide the fact that they are quite literally farming influencers. If the influencers want to have any chance of getting out of the training sets on the street, they have to outperform the others. This results in streamers doing everything they can to get an advantage, from putting on a desperate act to preying on the viewer's emotions. In some videos, you might even see streamers gathered on a bridge or sidewalk. This too is part of the system. The algorithms on some Chinese platforms utilize locations for promotion, meaning if a streamer can go live from a wealthier neighborhood or shopping area, their audience will consist of wealthier individuals more likely to buy products. The few who make it through the bootcamp will be hired full-time by the agency. This means they will be paid about $780 a month and be required to work a minimum of six hours a day, as well as abide by performance minimums and sales if they want to keep their job. And of course, to make it so that there is no risk of losing the influencer, agencies put harsh clauses in the contracts. The reason why it happens in China, however, makes much more sense when you look at who is actually funding the streaming influencer farm boom. None other than Alibaba itself which announced it will be supporting the training of hundreds of thousands of streamers by funding over 1,000 of these streaming studios that we see in the videos. It seems that the money is just too good for companies to not take advantage of. And the concerning part is, Western companies are beginning to realize this too. In December of 2022, for instance, Walmart and NBC Universal partnered for a live stream shopping event. SnapBank is also investing in augmented reality technology to cut back on returns, and Amazon just recently launched its own livestream shopping platform. And this is the point where we reach some deeper questions. With surveys in the US showing the dream career for the next generation to becoming an influencer, could the livestream shopping industry be the next logical step? Could this be the start of a new salespeople generation based entirely online? There really isn't a clear answer. But if one thing is certain, it's that this method of advertisement turns a profit. And where there is profit, there will be companies behind it. Imagine a world where a majority of the live streaming space is made up of influencers peddling products to hit sales and earning quotas. A grim world undoubtedly, but one we might be heading right for. Thank you guys so much for making it to the end of the video. If you enjoyed, please consider subscribing or leaving a like as it really helps me out. What do you guys think of these influencer farms? Is it something that worries you? Let me know down in the comments as I'd really like to hear your thoughts. Thanks again for watching and have a good night.